So I'm going to go ahead and get started. Um, my name is Autumn Nagel. I'm a um, past 15 district president, but I also serve as vice president of leadership and outreach at Kentucky State CCA. Um, other board members that you have on the call right now that I know of at 15th or Kentucky State CTA is Sam Newman. She is the president elect at 15th District PTA. And Abby Piper, who is a board member of 15th District PTA. I don't see anyone else. I know, that, I know some of you all from um, PTA, so. Okay. Um, so this is just a quick um, advocacy workshop. We're going to touch on some ways you can advocate and where you can find the resources. But we're also going to uh, spend a little time at the end for Q and A about advocacy, but also of the upcoming proposed um, tax increase that's going to be on the ballot in November. And if you are already getting your ballots from your mail in, you could always already vote on that right now. So, <clears throat> or you can start in person voting soon. Um, so, in case you don't know our mission, um, it is to make every child oops, potential reality. I'm trying to move you all. I can't see. <laughs> there we go. Um, <clears throat> make every child's potential reality by engaging and empowering families and communities to advocate for all children, not just children in their school, every single child, all children. Um, so, this is our second advocacy workshop. Um, again, we're going to do the training here um, with just some information. Please um, be present and engaged. Um, be respectful of other people's uh, values and what they're contributing. Uh, respect one's time so we all can have a, a time to share. Um, oh, let up. <laughs> all right, so if you're not real familiar with PTA, um, National PTA was uh, founded in 1897. Um, <clears throat> and in that time, we have what we call three owner, or three founders. We have, um, and I always butcher their names, so I'm going to apologize in advance. Alice McLennan Brindley and Phoebe Amherst Amherst Hurst. I cannot say these names. Um, and then in 1970, we joined the National P PTA with the National Congress of Public Parents and Teachers, um, and that was actually founded by Selena Sloan Butler. So we merged for all children. So we actually consider these three ladies the founders of Kentucky PTA. So what PTA has advocated for in the past, my daughter's here, um, in the past has been the creation of kindergarten classrooms, child labor laws. I'm sorry, mommy's presenting. You can sit and listen, okay? Um, public health services, the hot and healthy lunch program, juvenile justice system. Dina, daddy got delayed. <clears throat> so why don't you play with my necklace over there, okay? Thank you. Um, <laughs> libraries and schools, you know, safe buses and improved playground safety. Those are just a small snapshot of what PTA has advocated for. And we still advocate for a lot of these issues. Um, what is advocacy? <clears throat> Here's the official definition, and you can read it. But advocacy is being there. It's advocating, creating a voice, showing your voice, helping other people find their voice. In schools and communities, in front of people, on the telephone, email, anything that you're doing to advocate for the well-being of all children. So I'm going to say this. There's no wrong way. If you're uncomfortable emailing someone, don't email them. If you feel better talking to them, talk to them. If you are scared to death of speaking in public, but you don't have a problem writing a letter, that's what you do. There's no wrong way to advocate. You're advocating the way that's best for you and for your family. So don't feel bad if you know you think you have to make those emails or you have to do those phone calls. What way is more comfortable with you? If we force if you force yourself to do something that you're completely uncomfortable with, you're not going to show your heart in it. And that is what really helps when you advocate, showing what your heart is, why you advocate, what your passion is. And you can have a passionate letter, or you can have a passionate phone call, or a passionate face to face. That brings more um, passion and more weight to your advocacy so um do what you're comfortable with not to say you can't push your bounds and expand yourself and be able to do that but don't put yourself in a position that you feel uncomfortable any questions about that i know i kind of jumbled how to figure that out and because i have the screen full if um sienna if somebody wants to say something i'm not noticing it just uh wave at me will do okay so um let me go back. 
So we're going to talk first quickly about advocating when I find it, your child's school. So a lot of you are PTA um, board members in your school itself, so you're already advocating through joining the PTA and being possibly on the board. There's also SBDM and other committees and groups within your school. Um, and I'm going to pop out of this real quick to show you some examples. But we have examples over here like racial equity. That's a very big thing that we're doing right now in our schools. Absence and removal of subject areas, that's another way to advocate in your school. Um, are you noticing that items are not being sent home so that all parents can read them? Um, are there safety or health concerns in there? And I want to show this to you just in case you're not familiar with. If you go to JCPS's website and you go to schools and you go to school profile pages, so I brought up Butler's right here. On this page, you can get your school website. This is also the racial equity plan for that school. Um, you can find, if you haven't been on the report card, um, this gives you so much information and helps you figure out what's actually going on in your school. Um, it gives you, you know, how many, okay, so this is as JCPS, this is for everyone. But if you do this, you can actually go down to and find your school and it will pop up. And you will see information just about your school, what the classification, if it's Title I, how many students are in there, um, you have your attendance rate, what your democratic makeup is, um, economically disadvantaged, but you also have even faculty and staff in the community. So in this right here, you even can go in here a little bit more, find out what your teachers are by gender, by race, racial, race, and ethnicity. See, I can't talk today. Um, so you can see that they have 49 females and 42 male teachers. And this is last year's numbers, okay? Um, here are your, your breakdown, your student-teacher ratio for that school is 18 to 1. It also has faculty profiles, showing what their education level is. Parent involvement, a lot of you are parents on here, so this is very interesting. I have lots of questions with the Board of Education on how did you, they figure this out because I don't actually think some of these are accurate. But the total number of students that come into the parent-teacher conferences, that's one way they do it. Um, how many people participated in the SBDM election? How many are on the SBDM? And then this one um, is where I wonder where they're getting this one. How many have contributed to volunteer hours in the school? Some schools are really good at keeping that record of when you walk in and doing that, and some PTAs are the ones keeping those records. So um, just something to, interesting to ask your school how they're reporting that to the state. It'd be interesting to find out. Um, so again, on this page, you can also see your school plan. Um, that's your C-Sipple. It tells you what the school's doing. If um, they're your SBDM minutes, every SBDM in your school has to submit their minutes. And so you can come down here and you can find the minutes for Butler. Why is it asking me for? There we go. I guess I tried to actually. Adam, can I stop you for just a second? Yes. So one of my frustrations with that website you were just showing is that it's often hard to know when the next meeting is. And I rarely ever see, an, at least for our school at DuPont Manual, I rarely see an agenda in advance of the actual meeting. Okay. Are, you, are other people at other schools having the same frustration? Anybody speak up? I'm new. <clears throat> Excuse me. My name is Lee Samuels, and I'm uh, Vice President for Olmstead uh, Academy North. So I'm new to all of this, so I haven't done any of the searching that I'm looking at so far. So um, I, I don't really know. Okay, I'm also new. This is Ashley Vaughn. Um, I'm with Smyrna Elementary's PTA. And this is also my first advocacy training, so I'm not familiar with what you're, what you're looking at either. I know there's a way to go through the profile pages on the school and stuff, but I've not personally looked for these things. When Autumn, you, okay, go this ahead. is Bobby Joe. Sorry, before Stuart um, officially was no longer uh, a SPDM school, they did have their meetings and stuff posted with an agenda. So there are some schools that actually do post the agendas and stuff out there before. So they may just want to reach out and find out why they're not posting them. 
Um, Jim, for your reference, my school puts them in the uh, newsletter the week before with the agenda in the next SPDM meeting. Okay, so I'll just share my personal experience. I brought this up with the principal countless times. The fact that there are very important topics on the agenda of our SPDM regularly. But the problem is that the parents and, and anybody not on the SPDM does not receive the agenda in advance of those meetings to know which meetings are worth attending. And I'm sorry, it's just, <laughs> it's a constant source of frustration at our school. <clears throat> I think and there's a requirement that you have to post them so far in advance. Do you know that? Um, I know who to talk to about it. Um, so, um, Autumn, I'll go ahead and weigh in on this one. I think that they are supposed to, but I don't know that they're required by law. Um, and Jim, I am um, the government relations person for JCPS. I will put my email in the chat. If you'll just send me a quick email to that effect, um, I'd like to pass that up the chain. That's okay. Um, I've got personal connections with the with the parent reps on the SBDM, so I, I end up getting this access, but the, but the, but the, the point is that everyone should, all parents, even sure. without those, those sort of connections, should have a, a visibility into what the SBDM is doing and should have the opportunity to decide which meetings they want to at least observe. They can't participate, but they can observe. Totally agree. I put my email in the chat for you. Thank you. Yeah, Shauna, uh, Shauna would be a really good person to find that answer from. Um, because she could tell us up to that if there was um, another way to do it. But yeah, everyone should have access to it. I like the fact that if you get it a week in advance, you have time to plan. Um, and I'm sorry you're not getting those. But yeah, thanks, Abby, for taking a lead on that. And we'll see if we can get you some help there, Jim. OK, um, so I'm going to go back up here. So that's where you can find, sorry, find those items and possibly not as quickly as um, we need, but I do want to let you know that's where you can find the at least the minutes and agenda passed after it's been done. Um, I don't think there's anything else to add on. Um, so um, your school plan is your uh, CSIP, which is you know what the school is going to do to, um, and you'll see the past ones there too. The turn if there's a turnaround plan. Um, you'll be able to look at those and see those. Um, anything else, questions about advocacy in child school? So advocate, can, uh, advocating in your local community, um, you know, it doesn't have to be just at your school. You can advocate in your local um, neighborhood. Um, this includes, you know, churches. There's a lot of churches that partner with schools to do after school um, activities or tutoring. Um, there's a lot of nonprofits that work inside your schools too. There's also other um, organizations like schools that come in like U of L and Spalding and a lot of our schools helping out uh, with programs. But there's also, you know, metro government, you know, they're part of the education system too. Get to know your representative, know what's going on. So an example to put on the side is Evolve 502. They're the ones that um, some of the metro council members actually help start with the starting funds for this program that's going to give um, you know, colleges to all of our students. Um, there's also advocating for your local businesses to help support your school. Um, in your neighborhood, if you have a business that um, is looking to reach out, they can be um, a, a read, uh, one of the readers at the school. They can help with other things. Um, um, you know, if they're having an activity and they need volunteers, you know, there's lots of businesses out there that want to help. They just don't know how. So giving them the option is a, always a way to um, advocate in your local community for your school or for your students. All right, and your school district. So JCPS has lots of community, lots of committees you can join. If you don't join them, you can also follow them on the uh, JCPS YouTube channel. They've gotten really, really active on that now um, because of the pandemic. So you can see a lot of these committees online now instead of having to be there in person. If you don't know your JCS board member, I recommend you get to know them. So getting to know them is just as easy as going to JCS's site, going to at, going to leadership and out, leadership and organizations, and going to your board members. If you don't know who they are, put your address in there and they'll tell you who it is. This is great for knowing what their schedule is, what their board meeting broadcast. You click on that, it's going to take you directly to the YouTube channel where they have the broadcast. 
Um, these are the meeting materials that has the agenda beforehand. They try to, they always have it out a week before and it has all the links so you can look at the presentations that they present at the board. And that way if you have questions, it's a great time to email your board member and say, hey, I have a question about this. They don't know the answer. It's something they can ask when they're doing the presenting at the board. Um, you also have your board member bios so that you can get to know them at the, and um, it tells you what schools are in. And so you can go to each board member. It will have the contact information also. So get to know them. Um, it's a really good way so that you know what's going on and they know that you're a resource too. So student assignment is very big right now. I'll oh, just forget to show you. But you can find these are the committees with JCPS that, um, that they actively have if you're interested in them. Um, how they pick members, everyone's different. Some are open to everyone, some of them are, so many board members have so many. So contact them and say, hey, I, you know, contact the, whoever the contact is for that particular meeting. And I say, I'm interested in being on this committee. Do you have any openings or when is the next time they're open? Um, I believe this one doesn't have any, you know, anyone can go on that one. Um, so, um, you know, these are all things, you know, JCS has two surveys out, well, one survey out right now and one um, about the form that's going to be next Tuesday and I've got information on that later. So those are two ways to reach out and talk to the district. Um, you've got the racial equity plan, you've got um, infrastructure concerns, um, you know, all these things are things you can actively, you know, give your voice to at the district level. Okay, advocacy in your state. Um, uh, I know what, I forgot to pull that one. Okay, so I'll pull, I did pull up the Kentucky Board of Education. They're another board that does have uh, power over what goes into our education system in the state of Kentucky and, and city of Louisville. So getting to know them, there are a lot of them. I don't think all of them picture here, but you can at least get to know what they're talking about if it's something that's concerning to you. You can also speak to them just like you speak at JCPS, I'll be honest. That's kind of on hold because of the virus, but I don't know if it is on hold with the board yet. Honey, I'll be with you in a minute. Cool. Let's see if your daddy's home yet. Let's see downstairs. Um, they have the, also have the meeting information and that information, but you can also go to communications right here and you can um, sign up to get their newsletters and the distribution list and anytime they have news releases or what they're gonna be talking about. It's a good way to keep in touch with state. And I failed to actually open up um, Kentucky's um, LRC. Um, so the LRC is a Louisville legislation, <laughs> see I got Louisville in the brain now, a legislative research commission, I think. And it has a way for you to access all of your um, elected officials. So you have all of your Senate, House, who is your legislator, you click on that, you type in your address and they'll pinpoint and give you who it is. Um, the, um, they have all the bills when they're in session, they'll have all the bills there. And when we get closer to session, I'm gonna try to talk Ms. Abby into giving you a way so you can see a little bit more of that. Um, but since we're not in yet, I'm not going to focus quite on that, but there are a lot of that. And Kentucky PTA is doing a um, legislative um, training the first weekend in November, and I'll just slide on this too, if you're interested. It's going to be all online this year, usually with in person, and then we go up to the Capitol and we show you where you can find all your legislators. But this is great, great information um, when it's in service which I didn't open that link either. Um, it'll tell you what's going on. Um, you can also see your live coverage. Here's this calendars and schedules. Obviously we're not in session, but this is where you could look at it. Abby, is there anything else that, um, I mean, they have committee meetings still. Yeah, so they are having interim committee meetings right now, which is usual. The unusual part is that you can't go to the Capitol to take them in. And so um, KET has done a great job of uh, airing all those. Um, and all you really just have to go to is uh, ket.org backslash legislature, and they run those constantly. But um, if you go to that homepage, original homepage, Autumn, um, yeah, 
and then you scroll down just a little bit see um, right there in the blue bar where it says scroll up just a little bit oh yours is different than mine uh, legislative calendar right there um, in the blue bar right next to live coverage you hit that legislative calendar <laughs> uh, down, scroll down. the second blue bar under the fic under the picture oh okay yeah you if you click that you can always see what is happening this week they have links to what's on the agenda if they don't drop the agenda right in that's a really good resource you can usually check it on sunday um afternoon and see what's in the week ahead if you're interested in taking some of that in or just to know hey this is up uh right now in committee and um you can always reach out to autumn or to myself and say hey uh, what's going on in this? Is there anything I need to know? I cover all those committees uh, for the district anyway. So if there's ever anything you want to know about what's going on with that issue, um, you're welcome to reach out to me as well. And if you're wanting to know who's on which committee, um, uh, oh. each of them will tell you in their bio who their committee, what committees are on. But there is a place on here somewhere, and I'm not as familiar as I used to be. If you just go to the top bar where it says committees with that drop down. Ah, oh, see, there we go. Yeah, and you just click on the name of the committee, whatever committee you want, and it'll have a full roster. So if you want education, these are your members. And, just so you all know, uh, and those link, but just so you all know, those uh, committee members will change in uh, January. They do shift them around a little bit. So just know that that might not be the case in January. And if you ever want to email all of them, you can just email them or call your LRC and they will put your message to every one of them. All right, so that's a really short synopsis on, on Kentucky, let's be honest. Um, school testing is something that's, you know, um, that you can advocate. Uh, parent representation, representation on the SBDMs has been challenged in the past and Typically, it's something that's on every agenda the last couple of years in um, Frankfurt. So always keep an eye on that. Um, the digital divide is a, uh, one that I think is going to be uh, popular this year, too. Um, okay. Any other questions about that? I know I went really quick on state. Okay. Nationally, um, it's harder to get to our national reps as easily as it is, um, especially our Senate reps. But you can, um, PTA does have a legislative conference that they go in every March. And um, Kentucky PTA, I've gone to four, three of them, I think. And we meet with all of our representatives or their representative aides uh, and talk to them about issues that are important to us. Um, so it's always funding with education. A lot of times the last two years has been about infrastructure. Um, and National PTA has all of their information. I know I opened this one. Uh -huh. PTA Advocacy, it has all of it. It has how you can become, um, they'll send you alerts when there's something that's in the legislature that they'd like for you to reach out and talk to your representative. Um, there's PTA positions on all of them. There's resources. All of this is right there on PTA's website. Um, if you want to see what they did at a um, at the legislative conference, then you can find the advocacy uh, event it's a legislative conference, and it'll show you what we talked to our legislators about back in March. All right. So um, PTA Cares is a new program that 15 district has started. We're trying to help advocate in our community. That's what this is one. I, one aspect of it is the training, um, but we're also trying to help our families. So we've always had the clothing assistance program since I think 1975, and that is one way that we can help our community, but we also have our own um, new links where we're asking families if they need help to reach out to us. So it's on our main website, PTA Cares, it's under advocacy, and it gives you a little information. It's community advocacy referrals empowering students. So if we get a referral, we're going to try to find someone to help in the community. If we can't, we're going to see if we can do it. We do a Facebook page. This is a new program, so we're, we're learning on this. Um, we do have the advocacy page, and then we also have, you know, helping for the family. 
and both of these do have links on there that tell you, you know, where to go to and how to get that help. Um, again, a new program, we're learning, so be patient with us, but if you have a need and you're not finding a way, fill it, we're going to start with the first seat. but we all have people in the community that we can reach out to. Um, someone needed um, a washer, and Justin and his group was able to find them a washer, so that helped that family with that washer. It's a small thing, and it was a used washer, but it got them what they needed to make their life a little bit easier. Um, so that is what we have um, set up. If you're interested, you know, let me know. We're, uh, I thought we'd ramp up a lot during the beginning of the year, but with NTI, it's been kind of slow. Are there any questions about that? Okay, so um, the next portion, I'm actually, um, is there anything, questions about advocating on the local, state, national level that I can answer before we turn over to um, Abby, basically? <laughs> okay, so if you don't know, Abby Piper, who's been talking on here, um, she, um, she's going to give you a little bio about her, but we are going to talk about the details of the tax increase, and I do have some links. And this will be uploaded to the website. And um, so you'll be able to come back to this PowerPoint if you need those links. Um, and that includes the tax calendar, um, JCPS's site, 15 districts, and even the yes flat for JCPS. So Abby, I'm going to turn it over to you. Would you like me to make it? Would you like to share or just talk like you did last time? Uh, yeah, I will. Um I will share here in a second. Me. Yeah, give me a uh, give me screen. No, I got it. I'm gonna stop sharing. Never mind. Make me a screen share if you don't care. I'll uh, show sure. Okay, so you should be able to share now. Okay. So I am going to put this up just to have as a backdrop for you all to see. I'm going to zoom in a little bit on it so that you can see it a little better. Um, so I'm here tonight to talk just generally about um, advocacy and about the tax initiative. Um, for those of you who don't know me and I see some friendly faces on here, um, I am Abby Piper. I am the executive administrator for government and community relations for Jefferson County Public Schools. That is a very long title that I did not choose. Essentially, it means that I do all of our local, state, and federal policy and lobbying. Um, so deeply um, embedded in the advocacy work of this district um, and spend a lot of my time um, really fighting for kids, fighting for parents, fighting for families, fighting for schools. Um, so I could not be more passionate about this work. I think you'll find that uh, as we interact over the years. But excited to be a new um, liaison to the PTA um, and excited to do some work together. We've made some great strides so far. Uh, I want to say thank you to the board uh, for um, going ahead and endorsing the uh, tax initiative. Um, and so I want to put that out there as we talk about this. This is a, that's a hard vote to take. I know that. Um, but it is also really important that we all um, take stock of where we are in Jefferson County right now and why this has to be done uh, at this moment. So You'll see on this case for new investment, which I'm not going to belabor, I'm not going to read out loud, but um, there are basically three reasons why we absolutely have to do this right now. Um, the first is we have a significant um, in, and impending facilities crisis in this district. And I know that's a strange conversation to have while nobody is in schools, um, but the fact is that uh, one in five buildings, and we have a, a, a hundred and 60 some buildings in this district, one in five of those has uh, an end of life HVAC system. And what that means is that the health department could come in at any time and close the building and tell us we can't get, keep kids in there uh, if the HVAC fails. Now, that's just part one, um, but I wanna point out to you, um, and I'll share this other document real quick, that um, here's what it costs to replace a new HVAC versus what it costs to build a new school building. So when we talk about facilities crisis, what we mean is we have not built schools in Jefferson County. It has been extremely unpalatable and, and 
politically charged uh, to do so. The reason for that is that uh, you have to have significant bonding capacity in order to do facilities upgrades. And our bonding capacity at this time is really going towards these HVAC renovations. And you can see here, for the cost of building a brand new elementary school, or for the cost of renovating at a high school HVAC, we could build a brand new elementary school and have several million left over. I mean, and I so mean, really- we're not seeing your slide, whatever you're, you're presenting as far oh, as. No. Really? Uh, yeah, I, I'm, I'm seeing the case for new investment. I don't see the, co the cost of a new school versus Thank an you. Thank you. Let me see what I can do. It's those tabs, Abby, those tag on tabs. <laughs> I know. Oh, they're awful. Let me go back. You are screen sharing. New share. Okay, there we go. Thank you very much, Jim. Can you see it now? Yes, thank you. I am a millennial, but I'm not good with technology. I'm just gonna go ahead and admit that. Um, so you can see here, for the cost of renovating at high school HVAC, we could build a brand new elementary school. And that brand new elementary school could have all of the, um, new construction, the energy efficiencies, all of those things, but also um, a lot of the things that science is now telling us children do better in different learning environments. So um, this is a little known fact and, and a very sad one, but uh, when many of the schools in Jefferson County were built, um, all of the schools at that time were, which is really in the 40s, 50s, 60s, even 30s, um, those, <laughs> School design was uh, mimicked based upon, or modeled based upon the same blueprints that were used for developing prisons and jails. Uh, and the reason for that was that um, they really, I mean, it was, it was just a, here's how you make people move and go to places. Um, but over time, I think we've all been in a building and realized, gosh, this feels a little institutional. Um, and so that is part of the reason that when you go in schools that are really dated like ours are, you get that feel. We want light, bright classrooms that help stimulate um, young minds. We want safe facilities. We want healthy facilities. Um, and we want to be efficient with the money we're using so that we are putting money into buildings that is really going to impact learning and not things that you don't see that is millions of dollars on an HVAC system. So that's a big part of this. The other part of this is you've heard us talk about uh, student assignment changes. And you've also heard us talk about racial equity. Um, that's a twofold investment, the first being that we want to um, provide more supports to our schools uh, for racial equity. And that doesn't mean just putting money into schools in West Louisville, which of course we do need to do. Uh, it means that we want to make sure that all staff, all parents, all families have access to implicit bias trainings across the district, that they have access to in, um, you know, innovative curriculum that is not Eurocentric, that we have access to textbooks and to regular novels and books that kids want to read in our libraries that is uh, culturally competent and racially um, you know, equitable. So that's a big part of that work as well. We also wanna recruit and retain our minority teachers. That's an expensive program that we've put in place this year, uh, but a very important one. And so we partnered with Simmons College and the University of Louisville so that we can not just recruit and retain teachers, but be proactive about uh, recruiting and retaining minority teachers. Studies show um, across the board that when you have students that see uh, or interact with a teacher that looks like them at least once in their K-12 career, it does impact achievement positively. Uh, and so I think that that is important for us to continue doing that work. Finally, when we talk about racial equity, we know that every day, of course, not now, but during normal circumstances, we have six, and give or take kids who live, live in West Louisville and they get on a bus to go to school in a community that is not their community and they don't have any choice in that. And so that is something that frankly, as we looked at it, was completely inexcusable. Now I know that the process of student assignment is contentious. We're still going through that process. We're still taking feedback on that. But the bottom line is, regardless of what we do with student assignment, Schools in West Louisville have not been invested in. The third floor at Shawnee Academy has been condemned for a quarter century and more. Um, and so 
right now we're making those investments in Shawnee. We're revamping that third floor. Uh, we're redesigning the pool, which I, I remember last um, last summer when the pools were closing, we were approached by the city and said, well, can you open your pools to the public? And we only had one pool we could open to the public because the Shawnee pool uh, had been shut down by the local health department because it leaked six inches of water every night. These kinds of things, when we talk about investment in facilities, have an impact also on the way that students believe that we um, that we believe in them. And so, um, you know, we want to make sure that kids and families understand when they go to a, a building that's crumbling, it says something about what we believe of their capacity. We want to make sure that across this district that is not the case. So that's a part of this um, conversation. Let me go share, new share. Um, the other thing that I want to show you today, if I can find it, is this. Lord have mercy. <laughs> we'll just go back to this one then. All right. So that has a lot to do with where we are on um, the need for facilities. But we also want to talk a lot about, and this is where advocacy really plays in, um, in, in a way that I think that we can all work a little better together. There's a, a, there's a formula in Frankfurt that determines how we get uh, reimbursed for our per pupils allocation. And that formula is called the SEEK formula. It was created in 1990 after uh, the passage of the CARA Act in eight, 1989. And essentially what that does is all of the, um, the legislature chooses to fund on a per pupil basis into this formula. So last year, the, the amount that they funded for, for uh, per pupils was $4,000 per student, essentially. Now, when it goes through the State Department and in through that funding formula, what happens is districts like ours get penalized. So we get about 2,300 out of that 4,000 per student. But a district in uh, rural Kentucky that has lower property values might get 6,000 per student. Um, and so it all, it's, they call it an equalization formula. Um, because of that, every time our property assessments increase in Jefferson County, we lose millions of dollars in that formula. Just last year alone, we lost $8 million from the previous year, even though the funding level stayed the same uh, because our property assessments went up. And so when the formula recalibrated, we lost millions of dollars. So the long and short of that is Frankfurt is not investing in Louisville um, and in Jefferson County schools. And it's because of the statutory formula. And that's something that we can't change at this time. But they're also cutting other programs that used to help us make up the difference, right? They're cutting programs about teacher recruitment and retention. They have not funded textbooks and instructional, instructional materials for several budget cycles now. The transportation that they're uh, supposed to pay for at 100%, we get 50 cents on the dollar, uh, give or take. And so the, all those little things, they pile up. And uh, districts have to pick up the cost. Here's another perfect example. The National Board Certified Teachers are required in statute to receive a stipend. Um, KDE does not give us the money for that stipend. They give us a portion of it, but they, but they tell us that we're required by law to make up the difference. And so all of that comes out of general fund monies. Um, so part of this, this conversation is every other district in the state of Kentucky has increased their property rev revenues over time. We have done that to a degree but we have not passed a, uh, a nickel tax or any significant recallable tax at all. Um, and that has put us behind over the years. And every year that we don't do that, we get further behind. So um, we wanna recruit the best teachers. We wanna make sure our students and our schools have um, the, the best facilities to work, work in, all of the updated materials that they need. Um, and we also want to really expand on our mental health supports. So that's the third prong here. We know right now, before the pandemic, one in four kids in the United States said that they have an unmental health, unmet mental health need. They wanted to talk to a counselor, they wanted to talk about medication, they need, needed some help for depression, whatever the case may be, uh, and they did not have access to that. And so last year, uh, we spent a good portion of money putting at least one mental health practitioner in every single school building. That was expensive, and we don't think that's even close to where we need to be. Kids are gonna come back from this pandemic with higher unmet mental health needs than ever before. 
We know that kids are experiencing trauma at home with parents who are losing jobs, family members who are contracting the virus or maybe have died. Um, the uh, issues of racial equity having come to the forefront and the riots in the streets and the protests um, and the, the killing of Breonna Taylor. So we know that kids are going through and processing all of this um, in great degree and they don't have a lot of professional help to help them do so. So that's something that we know that we have to do. Um, and it's when we talk about school safety, that's a big part of school safety is knowing that kids are supported, that they have access to those services. Um, and we do have the ability to provide some of that via telehealth because of state regulations right now. Uh, but we simply have extremely high caseloads. So if you think that you've got one mental health counselor for a high school that has 1800 students, that caseload is astronomical. Right. And so we know that we need to do more there. All right. Um, so that's what I have to talk to you about tax initiative generally. Um, I want to talk to you about the ballot and what's going on there so you know and are prepared for that. Um, tomorrow, by the way, is the last day to request a mail in ballot. You have to get that in by 4 p.m. If you want a mail in ballot, you must request that tomorrow by 4 p.m. Um, Monday, we will have a series of endorsements on this initiative coming out, including the PTA's endorsement. Um, so we thank you very much for that. I want to give you a heads up there. Early voting starts next Tuesday, October 13th. That is very soon. And it will run for three weeks, including Saturdays for the very first time uh, in Jefferson County uh, until Election Day. So it'll be basically Tuesday, three weeks till, the, till Election Tuesday. Um, so you can look up those locations online where you can go and vote early. Um, we have 15 schools that will be open for uh, in-person voting only on election day. And you can also see that news online. Um, but if you need me to send it, I'd be happy to do that as well. On the ballot, the ballot question for this initiative is, the, is here's all of your stuff. And then you flip it over. It's right first question on the back. And it's there with two constitutional amendments. The question and the answer don't make any sense. I'm going to acknowledge that and we're going to walk through why and walk through what it means. The statute, Kentucky law, requires us to write the question as for or against. And so the question on the ballot will say, are you for or against the uh, tax increase, essentially? Um, and then the answer options are yes or no. And so if you read it, from a purely grammatical standpoint, what it means is have you decided? Are you for or against the tax initiative? And then you can reply yes or no. It doesn't make any sense. Uh, we talked to the county clerk's office and they essentially told us that their software is not compliant with state law. And so their software will only allow you to put in a yes or a no. So <laughs> if you vote yes, it means you're for the, uh, the, the tax initiative. If you vote no, it means you're against. <laughs> Long story short. Abby, Abby would I... you like me to actually read it? Yeah, do you have it? it? Yeah. So it says, okay. are you for or against the Jefferson County Board of Education better supporting the education of students in Jefferson County Public Schools, including improvements to school facilities by le levying the real estate and personal property tax of seven additional <laughs> cents increase per $100 Valuation, yes or no? Okay. And, and Abby, I can add that I've already voted absentee, and with my absentee ballot, I received a very small piece of paper from the clerk's office explaining that if you vote yes on this initiative, it's for this. No means this on the initiative. So at least they're, they're making some effort to clarify that. They are, they are. Um, and so we're happy about that. I, I, I appreciate that. I have not, I'm not doing the absentee ballot. So I, I didn't know, that's, that's good to know. Um, it was very confusing when you first get it. So it, it does, and they did send a little blue piece of paper with it, trying to, trying to make sense of it. But if you don't get clarification, it is confusing. Yeah, it is. It is. Um, so essentially, we've talked about what, why we need this. Um, the board has passed, passed a resolution about how the money will be spent, and it's in those three buckets. Um, and you can also find that online. Uh, but that's the gist of where we are in the tax initiative. And I will pivot just uh, briefly over to general um, election info and a little update on the advocacy side from the district as well to give you an extra layer of um, information on that. Uh, 
first of all, I want to pile on to what Autumn said about knowing your Metro Council member. Um, they have neighborhood development funds, NDFs, and they have a little, every council member has a little pocket of these funds every year that they're allocated in the city budget. And they often spend those monies on our schools. Uh, we had one that helps assist us in paying for the Eastern High School track. We've had some that have helped with playgrounds. We have some that help us with, um, we have one that helps with mental health counselors at Southern High School. Um, so they do spend money and they spend that money in our schools. It's important that you do know your Metro Council member. Um, and so I would encourage you definitely to do that. That was great, um, Autumn. Uh, one of the things that I think would be helpful to this group, if you want to know when JCPS is having board meetings or um, other committee meetings that are live, if you go to their YouTube channel and you subscribe, you'll be subscribed. But if you hit the, there's a little bell next to the subscribe button. If you hit that alert, it will alert you on your phone or whatever uh, notifications you have set up on your devices every time that they go live. That's really helpful to me. I do it with the Kentucky Department of Education as well, so that I always know when they're kind of hopping on and doing something and I can at least check in and see if I'm interested. Um, so during this um, election, I wanna make sure you all know, all of the House members are on the ballot. All 100 members of the Kentucky House of Representatives are on the ballot. They go on the ballot every two years and it's 100% of them every time. Um, so be aware of that. Uh, we have some pretty tight races in Jefferson County right now. Um, and then we have a group of folks that are uh, uncontested and will have no opposition in getting their seat. Some of those folks are Attica Scott, um, Josie Raymond, Mackenzie Cantrell, Joni Jenkins, they don't have races. Um, but we have some tight races uh, between Maria Sorales on the East End, who is, uh, her opposition is Ken Fleming, who was formerly in that seat before. Uh, Tina Bojanowski, she's a JCPS teacher. Uh, I'm not sure who, who her opponent is right now, but uh, she's in one of those districts that is tight. Uh, again, Jason Nemus uh, has had a tight race for several cycles now, um, and he is facing Margaret Plattner. Um, Jerry Miller has a race um, against Jeff Graham, and uh, Kevin Bratcher and Suzanne Kugler are going after it in the South End. So just those are important races to watch. We've seen over the last few elections that um, the suburbs are turning from red to more of a purple, if you will. And so um, some of those seats are volatile right now. It'll be an interesting thing to watch in terms of trends as well as knowing who your folks are uh, come January. Um, half of our Senate is up. So we have 38 members of the Senate, 17 are up this, this cycle. Uh, in Jefferson County, we don't have any really contentious seats at all. Uh, Julie Rocky Adams uh, is, is got, I don't think she even has opposition. Uh, Mike Nemus is pretty safe in the South End. Um, and we have a Metro Council member, David James, or no, David Yates, I'm sorry. David Yates, who uh, resigned from being Metro Council and um, he faces no opposition now. He won his primary. So he will take over the seat formerly left by Perry Clark. Um, I want to let you in on a couple other things to be prepared for. Um, many of you have seen the parent surveys that went out um, regarding returning to um, in-person classes. I just want to put out there that that is not you're not making a final decision. We're not asking you to make that decision at this very moment. What we're trying to do is prepare for the eventuality that we will go back to school, um, hoping that, you know, that the rates start going a different direction, obviously, than they are currently. Uh, but to help us begin to plan for what proportions of our student population are wanting to come back and what um, proportions are, are comfortable staying home so that we can adjust our staffing. Right now we've got, um, staff being able to uh, request accommodations if they are an at-risk uh, individual or the caretaker or live with a person who is at risk and want to make sure that we keep all of our staff safe. Um, that's particularly going to be tough for um, some of our bus drivers and our nutrition staff who um, have an average age much higher than um, most of our other populations. So we're working with our union partners right now and working with staffing just to make sure that when we get to that point, we keep everybody safe, but we also have enough people in the buildings uh, to be with kids as they transition back in. So I want you to be aware that when you fill out that survey, you're not committing right now. You're just helping us start to lay plans for when we, when we will go back. Uh, the board has extended the NTI through uh, mid-October. We will see them go back in the next week or two to discuss uh, when they will phase back in. Um, I will... Dr. Polio has said repeatedly he wants kids back in school. We will do everything we can to get kids back in school. 
um, but the trend data is not looking good right now. And so anything that you all can do to help communicate to our families and to everyone in this community, if we want to get kids back in school, we need to get people wearing masks because it's, the, the more that those rates continue to go high, it's very, very difficult for us to make a good decision. So I want to have your all's help in promoting that as well. Um, Abby, can I stop you just for a second and ask a quick oh question? Autumn and Sienna and whoever else on the district, because we are getting pressure from parents that the PTSA should be advocating against an in-person uh, return to in-person anytime soon. And and honestly, I don't know what role we have, what, what role what role we should be taking on here. So any guidance you guys have on that would be appreciated. I was just going to say, I'll second that, Jim, and sort of the idea of most of what I've seen is that we feel like even to fill out that survey, we need more information about what is going to happen with programs and specialty schools and um, AP classes and, and that sort of thing in terms of parents being able to help make good decisions about even filling out that survey. I've heard the same thing and, and have passed that along. I'm glad you brought that up. Um, we've had several folks actually through the PTA contact me and we're getting some answers for them um, related to that. But but duly noted, your feedback is is uh, being considered right now that uh, it, it is very difficult for parents to take that survey not knowing any of the details. So we are passing that along. I would expect to see another survey uh, coming out shortly. And when I say shortly, I mean a few weeks from now. I guess what I'm asking for is I don't know if district is going to take a position on returning to in-person. And I mean, I, I just don't know what role we have for making that decision or for influencing that decision. Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. Uh, so we do have um, parent uh, PTA representation on the task force that is looking at the reopening, um, but it is not outside of the realm of possibility for this uh, group to um, pass a board resolution or to, um, you know, have any other uh, formal action to go to the uh, to the district and say this is what we urge and this is what we don't urge. Um, I don't have any dog in that fight, but I will certainly help you get your voice heard. Um, I, I would say this, it is, um, it is really, really tough for you all right now, and I know you're getting hit. Uh, parents want to go back to work. They don't, you know, they're paying, some parents are paying extra to have people come in their homes. It's really, really tough. I know that. Uh, but I also know that many of our folks have deep concerns about us really not being just in the orange category, but we're careening toward red right now. And that's not a good situation for us to be in. Our numbers are far higher uh, than they were in March when lawmakers told us to close down. And so we have to take all that into consideration. And we do want to hear your voice. So if you all decide to do anything like that, I will certainly make sure that it gets to the superintendent's office and that task force to be heard. I'm, I'm encouraging the students to take it up directly with the school board representatives because they're the ones who ultimately make the decision. That's true. You, yeah, always encouraged to do that. Jim, I, I hadn't thought about us making a statement on that particularly. It's a good point. <clears throat> I have been directing everyone to my school, school board member and asking them what they think is what they consider safe enough for their kids to go back. Because once you pressure someone that says, I want my kids back now, well, what does that mean? Does that mean you want masks or what masks? Because I have a really hard time when someone says, hey, shh. I have a really hard time saying, I want my kid in now, but wait a minute, do I really want them in a mask all day? I have a kindergartner. I would love for her to know what kindergarten is really like because she has no clue right now. But am I willing to have her sit on a mat with a laptop in a classroom where they spread them out now they're not, and they're not allowed to touch? That teacher's gonna spend her entire day going, Please don't touch each other. Please stop. Please stop. Because kindergartners just gonna run and hug each other. That's what kindergartners do. So I, I will definitely, you know, um, suggest we put it on the agenda, Santa, to look at for next month when we have our meeting this month. This yep. month in October. But um, get that feedback because I would love to find out what people are willing to say that their threshold is for them to come in because I think. Once you start digging it down, they don't want them in as much as they think. Yes, we're all crazy. I'm crazy with NTI, let me tell you, with a kindergartner. But I'm not willing to put her safety or anyone else's at risk at this point. Um, but it's a good point. I didn't, I didn't think about us making a statement. Thank you. 
I agree, Autumn. I think we will add that to our district um, minutes or agenda for October in a discussion of sort of what our general stance is with understanding that um, overall what we do want is from the district is the most information they can give in the most timely manner that they can give and also sort of the conversation of um, individualized looks at different categories. Um, high school is a very different option than elementary school versus um, students with special needs, that sort of information that we can add to our agenda to at least give a position statement and, and try to encourage the board members in um, what our voice would be. Abby, do you have a date when they're supposed to sunset that um, survey? There's no date that we're supposed to fill it in by that I'm aware of. I haven't seen a date. I have to look. I'll find that out for you. Um, I'd have to look. And, and just uh, for your all's knowledge as we go forward in this conversation, uh, what Dr. Polio had wanted to be able to propose if the numbers were good was to have um, elementary start back and then sixth grade and, and phase it in. And then if that goes well, then phase in sixth grade and uh, ninth grade. And then if that goes well, then 10th grade and seventh grade and phase that in accordingly. Um, I don't, I don't think that we're going to be able to do that by, um, October 20th the way that we had wanted to um, but that's the idea is that we're, we're looking at how do we do this in a way that blends it because we know honestly elementary kindergarten it's it's really hard it's really hard um, and we do want our kids to get back and have those experiences um, so yes duly noted happy to help and provide resources in any way I can answer any questions you all keep those coming um, and uh, just know we're here to we're here to talk we're here to communicate and we want to hear from you um, I will say um, along those lines, the accountability um, data usually comes out around this time of year, um, but we did not take K-PREP in the spring because it was waived. Um, but there will be a release later this month, and that release data from the State Department of Education will include two things. They will not release anything that is an, um, an incomplete data set. So they're not releasing ACT scores. Uh, because not all students were able to take them, uh, but they are able to release the graduation rate and they are able to release uh, the results of a, um, a test called ACCESS that evaluates uh, the performance of English language, the progress, shall we say, of English language learners. So that will come out for every district in the state. Um, and there are some other things that are in the school report card uh, that will be published, things like, um, you know, uh, school safety plans, those kinds of things. Uh, but the traditional K prep accountability uh, data will not be uh, will not be present. So I want to let you, know, you all know that know that it's coming. Um, Secretary DeVos in uh, Washington D.C. has indicated to us that she uh, is in no way, shape, or form going to entertain any uh, waivers for the spring for accountability testing. So um, just be aware of that. I don't know how you all feel about that, but uh, we are really struggling with the concept. Not that we don't think we should test because we want to know exactly where our kids are and we will do map testing and all those things that we can do uh, when we get back in school. Um, but the, the accountability system, the way it's set up, is really set up to penalize um, and, and label schools. We're really not a fan of that. Uh, but we also, we know that we, we want to be held accountable. But the high stakes decisions that occur after the accountability system um, data is, uh, is uh, revealed can be really damaging to a school culture and climate. And I'm sure that there are folks on here who know that um, and have experienced it firsthand. Things like uh, the department can uh, determine the uh, leadership capacity, quote unquote, of a principal after um, a turnaround, uh, turnaround audit. Um, that data can also cause a school to go into what we've used to formerly call priority status, uh, but is now called continuous support and improvement CSI status. And at that point, um, a district loses their SBDM. Uh, so we know that these are high stakes decisions that are made um, on student populations and we don't want the uh, impact of COVID uh, on spring testing to uh, cause those decisions to be made that, that really help uh, or pull local control from those schools. So I just wanna put all that on your radar. Those results are coming out uh, in a few weeks. Uh, they'll be largely incomplete compared to previous years, but just know that that, that cycle is still moving. Um, 
So maybe I'm wrong, but I don't expect Secretary Devos to be in her position in the spring. So just well, we can all hope. I'm not making any speculations on that, um, but we we will see. We will see. Um, it is worth contacting all of you, contacting your congressional offices, uh, Yarmouth and um, and McConnell right now to urge them to pass school funding in a, in a fifth coronavirus package. I know there's conversation that that will not happen until after the election, um, but it is very, very important. And many, many districts are gonna be in a tight, tight situation um, here soon if that package is not released. And I know we're bumping up on time. I'm trying to hurry up on them, but one last thing, uh, I just wanna let you all know, um, I am available and able to um, assist or comment or whatever you all will hear from me um, even in the coming months as we look at the upcoming legislative session. Um, Autumn, I'm happy to do a little little webinar thing on how you use that uh, website. Um, it is very difficult to use and counterintuitive, but I have had to learn uh, by necessity. So I'm happy to share all my, all my tips and tricks. Um, and just know that we go into this legislative environment, there will be uh, basically three big things going on. People are gonna be looking at budget, number one, because they only passed a one-year budget last year. And so we're gonna to have to pass a budget uh, for next year in a short session, a 30-day session. That's gonna be extremely challenging. Uh, and it's never been done before because we've never uh, not passed a budget, uh, a two-year budget in, a, in, an even, uh, in an even year. So uh, that's gonna to be tough. Uh, so budget's gonna be front and center. Coronavirus relief, I suspect, will also be um, front and center uh, for across all spectrums. Um, pension reform, I expect to reappear simply because they are looking to save dollars and they have been talking about pension and tax reform for a long time. Pension reform is probably easier for them to get done than tax reform. Um, so be looking out for that stuff as well. Um, and then finally, you'll see, um, without question, you'll see uh, priorities uh, among uh, the leadership on both sides of, uh, or both uh, House and Senate that would curtail the powers of the governor. There's been a lot of dissatisfaction upon um, his ability to um, issue executive orders um, throughout this process during the virus and not consult the legislature. So you'll see some of that as well. Um, again, stay tuned. I'll have more on that uh, at a later date. But otherwise, I'll take any questions you all have and uh, wrap it out. Abby, you spent a lot of time talking about ventilation. I, I, I think we all, I mean, I don't, we, don't, we don't have to spend a lot of time, but I think we all need to recognize that po you know, during COVID and post-COVID, ventilation is going to be even more important than it was pre-COVID. Absolutely, yes. Feel free to ask any questions, guys. There's only 10 of us here, so you've got a, a pretty uh, easy way to speak your mind. And you can ask questions about anything JCPS related. It doesn't have to be anything we've talked about. And if there's anything that you decide you don't want to ask, um, you know, you don't feel comfortable asking right now, again, my email is in the chat. Um, you know how to find me. I am your, I'm your go-to liaison with the district. So reach out to me anytime. And I know that Autumn and Bobby Joe and Sienna will tell you I am, uh, I am very quick about getting back. I, I will do everything I can uh, to do that. So. It's an easy crowd tonight. I think my daughter's got more energy over here. She's got Beethoven on a, a fishing thing. I don't know. <laughs> I thought she was going to hit the ceiling fan earlier, and that's why I went, ah! Okay. And thanks to redistricting, uh, the people in East Jefferson County, like myself, are not actually represented by Yarmouth anymore. We're now represented by Thomas Massey. Oh, yes. Well, call him anyway. <laughs> I'm not wasting my breath. I will say this, um, and we've talked a lot about reaching out to lawmakers, and Autumn is exactly right. You can uh, call the LRC hotline for state legislators and um, leave messages for a whole committee, for the whole caucus, for a whole, all House members. Um, so you have a lot of flexibility there. But I will say this, um, when you reach out to people um, and you send them emails or, or you um, make phone calls, those add up and they do matter. If you're going to send emails though, do not send form emails that someone sends you from an association. Make sure you tweak it a little bit. Um, and PTA is really good about giving you guidelines and letting you um, kind of craft your own message. Uh, but there are other groups out there that will send you, hey, send this, copy and paste. When lawmakers get those copy paste emails, uh, they don't pay any attention to them. So if you're gonna send 
messaging, make sure that you customize it, even if it's just a tad. I did that with the Vol 502. We already had an email out to go out there. I put it below mine and said, hey, this is why I support this. All of yep. our students need to have that opportunity. And I laid it out and then I sent it. So yeah, she may have gotten a form letter, but she got the personal in the front of, so that made more of a difference, I think. Um, so okay, I'll just go back here real quick. I don't know, am I sharing my screen again? Are you all seeing my screen, guys? Sorry. Yes, I think so. Okay. So this is also on our website. We've got this PDF if you need to upload it and look at it. I do want to tell you next Tuesday, JCPS is having, they have a forum scheduled. And I talked to them and they finally got back to me. And we actually got it out before JCPS did this morning um, about the fact that they are doing this forum and they're asking for your questions. So it's next Tuesday. It will be on the YouTube. But at the very end of the board meeting, and they don't have a lot. They just have some small things to do first. They do have a Google form where you can ask a question, and I don't know how they're picking which questions get asked, but it is about JCPS investment plan, what questions you have, you put them in there and they're going directly there. So I highly recommend you check that out. It literally is a form that says, what is your question? And you type it in. You can add as many questions as you want and submit as much as you want, but this is a way to get to them immediately instead of, typically we could go in front of the board and ask them, or they would have a community form like they did on um, student assignment or something. We don't have that opportunity distancing right now. So make sure you look at that. It's next Tuesday. Shh, one more second. <laughs> it's next Tuesday. Um, Thanks for mentioning that. I should have mentioned that. Thank you. That's why we're both working together. This is what it is. Um, uh, we are talking about discussion. Okay. Last thing, I did do a quick survey so you can let us know what you liked, what you didn't like. Five questions, easy peasy, lemon squeezy. I'll also actually put it into, shh, boy, she's active. Um, into the chat real quick. Um, remember, we've got a lot of information on our website and we do a lot of Facebook stuff. Um, but let us know what you need, what you want. We're here to help you. Um, to be a support to each of your all's units. Um, so please let us know what we can do. Um, anyone else have anything else they want to say? As soon as I find the chat box. We do have a training next Tuesday. Um, if you do want to miss the training to go to the forum, that is completely understandable. We will record it and post it up on YouTube later once we get all the information to Autumn. Um, that's all I think I have. I know we have a secretary and a fundraising class also coming up this month. And then we have some good ones coming up in in November. Look, I'm trying to go back. I think we're going to have a principal slash president's training together. Um, that was actually requested from a school principal that we do one of those classes um, and a grant writing class for November. And it would be nice to do the class Abby mentioned. So that would be a good one too for November. Anything you all need us training on or suggestions, we're happy to do these. This is what we're here yes. for. I'm going to put the survey in. Oops. I can't put it just to Sienna. Sorry, everybody. Here's the survey now. Um, and I do want to thank you guys. Um, and advocacy is an important part of PTA. That's what we started on. Um, so, you know, it's for all of our kids. And our kids need it right now. Let's be honest. Our kids need to know that we're there for them. Um, if that's all, I, this was recorded. I will be uploading it to uh, YouTube hopefully in the next 10 minutes. If I can keep her calm again so I can finish, I will put the uh, PowerPoint on the website also. That probably won't happen until tomorrow, but it will be on the website tomorrow. Autumn, just one more thing. I just posted a link in the chat to a statement that the manual PTSA just put out about racial inequity and injustice. and. We are forming an ad hoc committee to try to decide what specific actions we can take in support of that. So um, if that's useful to anyone else, there's a statement out there. It basically echoes the, the national PTA statement on the same issue. Thank you, Jim. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I got it. Mama, I'm going All right, to All right any you. other questions? All right, thank you guys very much. Um, 
<laughs> we appreciate all your time and uh, just going with us today. Again, if you have any questions, um, the information's out there. Please let us know. Abby put hers in there. The rest of ours is on the 15 District website. I'll put my email in there too. Um, but anything you need, let us know. Thank you guys. Thank you guys. everyone. Have a great evening. Bye. 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 Bye.